right, welcome to week three, day two. We are going to be doing more class stuff today in class. Discord was down uh, earlier in the day, so we kind of didn't have a 12 o'clock class because half the class couldn't log on. So we're doing this one instead. And sorry you guys don't get to play uh, Jackbox like the previous um, <laughs> class got to do because nobody could connect, not even the TA. Okay, so... Uh, there's a couple important things about classes. We need to really get in more with the um, rule of three today. Um, and uh, I do want to talk about sorting a little bit as well. So let's talk about, let's talk about sorting first because we were on operators last time. So let's say that we've got a class for a person. I'm just going to do a struct to make things simple. And we've got a string name um, and social security and I don't know um, zip code or something doesn't really matter age uh, did I get a haircut? no I just grew backwards so uh, int age sure sounds good okay so um, so let's now let's let's just do age uh, I don't want to. I don't want to type that much. <laughs> okay, so let's make a vector of persons. A vector of persons uh, named Vec, of course. <laughs> and uh, remember, you can use uh, brace initialization syntax, universal initialization syntax. So, like, if I do something like this, then this will make three people. And I need to put the name, the social, and the age for each person. So we're going to have here. Bill Kearney, my social security number is that. Legitimately, it's not. My age is 44. And then we will add in uh, Shook. Uh, Shook's social is 111111. And Shook's age is 20, 231. Fair enough. And then we've got uh, uh, Aaron. And the social of Aaron is uh, 420-666, and Aaron's age is 21. Okay, so are you still mad at me? Uh, undeclared, oh yeah, we need to... <laughs> so what happens you make your own vector class. There we go, how about that? Okay, there. Okay, so you guys understand we're making three people. If we want, we can make one more. Anyone want to be added? Let's do four people. Someone volunteer, Jose Lopez, all right, Lopez. Uh, your social is negative 1221, and your age is 39. And then uh, Margaret wants in as well. Okay, so we'll have Margaret Cromwell, social security number of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and age of 21, also. Okay. So, uh, and I need one more closed curly brace here. Okay, so you can, you can make it uh, class invariant, so security can't be negative. Yeah, uh, this isn't a class, this isn't, you know, this is a pods, right? This is, this, this is a pods. This is a plain old data structure, plain old data. No, no class invariants are enforced, um, if that makes sense to you. Okay, so if we want to sort by, if we want to sort by name, let's say we can do this. So we can say boolean bpop, boolean. You've heard of kpop and jpop, now comes bpop, operator less than, and this will take in a const person right hand side um, some people um, didn't really follow for now, um, the difference between the member the member function version and the global function version if I was doing this as a global function it would look like this it has to take two parameters and the reason for that is because if you have like a person A and a person B, and you want to say if A is less than B, 
there, there's essentially two different ways this, this operator gets called, and, and they're equivalent to each other, so you can't do both. If you have both of these, it's going to be uh, upsetting you. Make this const as it should be. Um, it's going to be upset. Like, this is ambiguous. These are identical to each other. Okay. The reason why you have to pass in the left-hand side here is because it's a global function. It's not attached to a specific person. When you have a member function, the left-hand side, A, is the person that the operator is getting called on. And so you'd, you would be like, return my name less than the other person's name. Okay. And you can call this other if you want. So if my name is less than their name, then I am less than them. Essentially is what that's saying. Okay. So uh, it essentially, when you, when you write this, it's like saying, it's like saying um, if a dot operator less than b. Like these two lines are essentially equivalent when you're doing the, the member function version. If you're doing the global version, it's like saying if operator less than a comma b. You guys see the difference here between between the two? That's a member function, and that's a global function named operator less than that takes two parameters named a and b, or left hand side, right hand side, or however you want to put it. Okay. So when you when you do this, C will either pick this one or it'll pick this one. If you do both, it gets mad at you. You can't do both. So you just have to pick one of the two versions. Okay. Alright. Because you guys understand. When it's global, it, you, ha you have to specify the left-hand side. When it's a member function, you don't have to specify the left-hand side because you're calling it on A. It's like A dot. So it's just my name, right? Kimi no wa, your, your name. So if we did it this way, it'd be left-hand side dot name is less than right-hand side dot name. So a lot of people prefer the global function version because it's more symmetrical, right? Like LHS, RHS, you know? Uh, some people prefer this version because it's less typing. Um, I, I'm I'm more or less agnostic on the, on the matter. Uh, I I just don't like I don't like the global version being in global space like this because it's just kind of like hanging out like you know between main and person and and I think logically this belongs inside of the person class and so what I do is I do this which would not compile. Let's get rid of the member function version for now so it doesn't. Um, and so we just make it a friend and then everything's fine and dandy All right okay so you guys understand so right. so that's kind of the way that I write it but any of those three versions are all essentially equivalent. What if you need to compare string one versus string two? Does it default to use your boolean? My bool? What do you mean my bool? I've written a function. This is a function called operator less than. Every time in C++ you do like an operator like this, it's it's actually calling a function called operator less than, operator plus, operator times. Um, and so I've written it, this isn't a bool. Bool is the return value. So when you compare two two people, you want to say true or false. Is Bob less than Sydney? And the answer is yes, because Bob comes before Sydney in the alphabet, right? So um, the uh, you make it a friend to, because it's not part of the class itself. Okay. This is actually a this is actually a global function. This it, you can't do it like this because it's. Um, if you did it like this, you'd, it would mean it's a member function, and it can't take two parameters, right? So instead, you have to make it a friend. Friend means, in this case, uh, friend here just means it's a global function, not a member function. Or sometimes free function is a term you'll see people use. So that means it's actually located down here, if you want to think of it logically. Right? It's actually... It's actually not a member function of the class. So it's a free function. Okay, this function uh, you made needs to take in two persons. Yeah, 
And either the, the left person's implicit, if you're doing it this way, as a member function, or you have to specify both people this way. So it takes two, two persons, and then it compares them based on their name. So uh, does that make sense, Portnoff, or were you asking a different question? So uh, the reason why we need uh, why we need operator less than is because sorting uses it. Okay. If it's a global, what's the advantage to defining within the struct? There's no like there's no difference between this and this from the compiler standpoint, right? This. There's there's no difference between between these two things from the compiler standpoint from the language's perspective. They're exactly the same. A friend function does um, friends also get access to private member variables, right? And so um, if you had like a get name function, you wouldn't have to use it. You just say dot name. Um, whether or not that matters, I don't know. But um, but I'm I, what I'm doing. The, the reason why I'm putting it here, Portnoff, is because conceptually. It makes sense to me for the function telling us how to alphabetize people should be inside of the class for for people. You know, like that's kind of where it belongs. Yep. So, uh, Shook, does that, does that answer your question? Like, just conceptually, it belongs there. But I kind of, I kind of like, I kind of like having the symmetry of having two people. Um, or if that's extra, you just do that. The member function version always gets access to, to, to the private member variables. Remember, the only people that have access to the, the private member variables are you and your friends, right? So um, if you had a global function that was not declared friend, then it would have to use like get name on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And maybe there's a slight Unlikely, but there might be a slight performance issue to that. It'll it'll probably be uh, in lined out by the optimizer. Okay, so the reason why we need operator less than is because sorting is very important in computer science. So uh, you sort a vector being be, begin begin. Thank you, vector dot end like this. Okay, this will sort vec by name. Okay, alphabetically, right? So it's going to um, sort all of these entries here by name, and then we can uh, we can print out before, see out the before, and we'll do the after, and then for every person, cons, reference for every person in the vector, we will see out. Person. So we'll need a double left arrow operator, friend, O stream, reference, operator, double left arrow, O stream, reference, out, that's person by reference, B. And we'll print out the name. Uh, how do we want to format this? Yeah, the name the social and the age. Like that. Okay. So we will print the array before, then we'll sort it, then we'll print it after. And so you can see before, uh, we are just in whatever order we push back it in, right? Like when we when we created the vector, this was just this random array, just whoever was volunteering to be on my list. It's like this. Then we sort it by name, and you see that now it is sorted alphabetically. I think it clicked when we pass in two persons to operator less than, less than, not greater than, operator less than. It overloads and looks for our overloaded less than operator function when we pass in, for example, two minutes, use the built-in operator less than, yeah. You don't you don't have to tell C plus plus how to do how to do this right like it it knows so there's built-in operators for all the standard library like strings and like and, and then like the 
primitives and all that stuff has plus and minus like where where appropriate defined on it. Sorting will sort the first parameter by default. Nope. It will not. You have to tell it. C++ has no knowledge of how to sort things. So um, if we split this into uh, first name, last name, Notice how I have to rewrite all the code using the class now because I'm refactoring it, right? I don't have any separation of concerns. Everything, both inside of the class and the people using the class, now have to change because I split name into first name and then last name. That's why we, that's why we, uh, that's why we ADT. You know what I'm saying? Like that's why we, um, uh, um, that's why we create the getters and setters and things like that so that we can refactor our code. Um, without breaking literally every bit of code that uses it. All right. So now if we sort, you'll see uh, All right. so you can see before it's the same same as before. It's the same same output as before. Um, the after though, you see how it's sorted on the last name. C H K L S. Okay. You guys see that? It's not the first field. You, you have to tell it. How do you sort a person? How you know? Tell me. You know what? What? What makes one person less than another? You know. Yeah. So. Margaret is less than Aaron, you know, and if we were sorting on the, the first, like no offense, Margaret, uh, if we were sorting on the first name, then Aaron would be less than Margaret, right? Because it's, it's alphabetical, it's alphabetical sorting, right? When you compare strings. Uh, where is the first last name coming from? What do you mean the first last name? Uh, we got, we got I, I refactored this so that the name was split into first name and last name. And so when we're sorting on, uh, when we're telling it to sort, we're saying sort based on the last name in your return statement. Uh, could you arrange the vector to be saved as sorted when the program ends? Yeah, you can, you can write it to disk. And then when the program runs, you, you load from disk. That's very common. So you can only define one lesson operator. Yeah, so that's, so how, how, do, I, how do I make it so that it sorts um, by age? Well, I could change this to be like, you know, age or something, but now I've lost the ability to sort on last name, right? So if we do this, then uh, we see that, um, okay. uh, yeah, so Aaron and Margaret, the two youngsters in the bunch, and then Shook out there uh, coming in at 231 years old um, is the greatest, right? What if we want to sort it the other way? Well, some people will do this. Like, what if they want to have the uh, ages sorted greatest to smallest? You could do that, and it, and it, and it works, I guess. Uh, a little bit counterintuitive. Usually what we do is we actually do a, re a reverse sort. So if you put an R here and an R here, uh, rend, rending it apart, it means reverse. So if you put, a, if you put an R there and an R here, then it will do a reverse sort on people. So, um, and it's not sorting by name anymore, by age, uh, and it will reverse sort by age. Okay. So you can see, yep, sorting greatest to smallest this time. Um, okay, but like like Otal's point remains, like. Um, like what if we want to be able to sort it in in different you know at different times we want like 
you know, in a web page, you can click on a column header and it sorts by this column or this column, right? You can only have one less than operator, but you can always make, you can always make um, extra sort functions, right? So we can have here a, uh, and this is technically a free function. I'll probably move it in later, but uh, I can make a function called sort by sort by first name, taking in const person left hand side, const person right hand side, and then this one would return left hand side dot first name is less than right hand side dot first name. And then I can make a function called sort by last name, 5s last and dot and dot and I can do y3 y shift p and do a sort by sin 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 and I can do y3 y shift p and sort by 3s age and dot oops sage oops Let's try that again dot and dot so I now have, if you, if you don't pass in any parameter like this, what did, what's my default? So default sorts by last name, okay? Use these to choose what to sort the vector. So by default, um, use operator less than to sort vector by age. Um, you would not need to overload that function requires the predefined overload. Uh, would, would it break your return statement if this was returned this point stage? Remember this? That's exactly the same thing. Remember this points to last name is the same thing as last name. There's no there's no difference. Uh, some people prefer it because again, it gives you that kind of symmetry. So it's like my last name versus the other's last name. And, and it kind of balances a little bit, even though it looks a little weird because this is a pointer and other is a reference. And so one uses the arrow operator, the other uses the dot operator. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not something that I care particularly about. I typically um, just write last name. So, but we got we got these guys here. So, how do we use them? Okay, how do we use them? So, let's say uh, after let's say default sort because we're about to get y two y shift p, and then we're gonna about to sort again, and now we're gonna sort by uh, first name. So, if you pass in a third parameter to sort, it will sort with that function, okay? So if I pass in here sort by first name, then uh, let's put some extra new lines in here and break it up a little bit. So it's, this is the default, you know, then we sort it, uh, this is just how it starts, right? And then we sort it by last name, you can see Cromwell comes in first. No shade being cast in your direction, Margaret, you are the number one student after the default sort. And uh, then after we sort by first name, Aaron jumps to the top despite um, coming second place after the default sort. Uh, um, you guys see that? So we sorted by last name here. We sorted by first name here. If you want to do it again, we can sort by social. Uh, see. Add paragraphs to my uh, my code here to make it a little easier to see. Okay, so y4y and 
paste, and now we're going to sort by social. So sorted by last name, sorted by first name, sorted by social. Okay, so you say Lopez has a negative social security number. Uh, Margaret has one three five six. Aaron Hare is 420 666. Um, okay, and we can do the same for age, although I, I think you get it by now. So do you guys see this? The sort function takes, oops. The sort function takes as an optional third parameter, a function. And that function takes in two people, because we're sorting people, right? The left hand side and right hand side, and it and it tells you what makes one person less than another person. You like it? You like that? It's pretty useful. Sorting is legitimately one of the main tools in your uh, quiver when you're doing computer science. So, um, uh, what was it? Uh, Shook was uh, asking me about a an assignment uh, the other day where uh, you have to count how many times um, a, a, a number appears, number from zero to nine, and then you have to sort it based on which one happened the, the most often. And so I solved that by essentially doing something like this, uh, struct counter, uh, and we had an int for the digit, and I mean, I could have used it short or whatever, but I don't care. And then int for account. And then basically uh, made a vector of size 10 because there's only 10 digits, 0 to 9. Then every time a digit came in, um, adding 1 to its corresponding count. And then after uh, we were done inputting all the, the numbers, uh, sorting it by count. And then printing out, you know, the, three, the top three digits that came the most often. So now that you know how to uh, do this, it all makes sense. Operator less than is the default. Histogramming, yeah, it was, it was histogramming and then sorting based on count. So, yeah, yep. Uh, you could use an unordered map uh, for, for that. You didn't, you could just use like a vector of 10 because there's only 10 digits, right? Like you don't need anything more fancy than that. So you just make a vector of size 10. Every time a number five comes in, a number seven comes in, you just increment the count associated with it and then you sort it. And uh, that's why we uh, kept track of the original digit because after you sort it by count, you you know your position isn't the digit you are anymore. So you have to kind of write that down, and then when it sorts, you're like, okay, we had we had twelve sevens, we had three nines, you know, whatever. So um, if that was uh, I think like a job interview question or something too. So yeah, um, yeah, sorting sorting by uh, you know your choice of you know parameter comes up a lot in computer science. Um, so many. So many problems can be solved by just like doing a sort or something, you know. Um, it's not always the most efficient, but hey, it's all right. Uh, why is operator less than the default one? Why not greater than? Greater than, uh, greater than can go to hell. Quoted Bjarni Strustrup. No, I'm kidding. Because uh, they don't care about it. They don't care about anything but operator less than occasionally operator double equals will matter. It's like, what does it mean for one person to be equal to another? You know, 13th Amendment, right? 14th Amendment, no slavery, due process under the law, whatever. Uh, what does it mean for one person to be equal to another person? Like you have to tell C++, it doesn't know, you know? So, bool operator double equals cons person other, I don't know, what does it mean? If our names are the same? Now there could be another Bill Kearney out there somewhere. In fact, there is. In fact, there's another Bill Kearney that teaches college. Not too far from here, like near Tahoe. So, um, he teaches like paramedic medicine or something. So, uh, messed up, Kearney? What's messed up? No, that's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
that's not my personal philosophy. I'm just uh, sort of uh, uh, paraphrasing the standard. It doesn't matter. They don't. They just don't use operator uh, greater than. It just literally doesn't matter to them. Double equals does come up though sometimes. So with like unordered maps and things like that. So like you have to define what does it mean for one person to be equal to another. And so maybe all four have to be the same, right? So return um, my first name equals others first name and my last name matches the others last name and my social matches the others social and my age matches the other's age. And that's it. Okay. So if all four fields are the same, uh, I told you I also said I didn't mess with you. <laughs> it's not my personal philosophy. I like greater than. It's the alligator that's hungry, right? But uh, according to the standard, it literally doesn't matter. You don't. They don't care about less than or equal to. They don't care about greater than or equal to. They don't care about not equal to. The only two that you will ever need to define are less than and sometimes double equals. Okay. And this will allow you to use like um, unordered maps. Um, okay. Is it just convention? Yes, it's just convention. They just picked one. So there's no there's no particular reason why it had to be less than operator rather than greater than operator. They're, sym they're symmetrical to each other, uh, but it's always less than operator that you have to define. It's just um, standards committee didn't like the greater greater than sign. I don't know. I don't know. Tell you. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you could, you could define the greater than operator and then define the less than operator in terms of the greater than operator or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, Yes, let's talk about the rule of three. So, first of all, let's do a little bit. Uh, let's just move this into move main.cc up into public and call this sort southern Bavaria. No, call this sort demo.cc. So, if you guys want a copy of that code to see how you can sort things, it is up there. Publicly readable now. And let's start from scratch here. And let's make a integer um, array equal to new int 1000. And we'll even zero fill it. Okay. So for int i equals zero, let's just print out the first, uh, I don't know, first 20 of it or something like that. See how our square bracket i. So this is going to print out uh, 20 zeros. Right, because we are the curly braces there is zero fill the array. It's a really nice feature of uh, of modern C plus so plus. You just be like, because before every time you made an array, you had to write a for loop to iterate over it and set everything to zero. Detected a memory leak, right? So, but it printed out twenty zeros, right? And we got a memory leak. Why do I have a memory leak? What does a memory leak mean? It means I'm allocating memory and not deallocating memory. Where, what should I do? What do I need? What do I need? What do I need to add to the code? A delete. How about that? You guys like that one? Does that 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 work for you? I remember the rule is every every new needs a delete, right? Yes. There's two things wrong about this. First of all, uh, you need uh, you need to use uh, delete brackets. Because uh, there is a different deleter actually for doing deleting a single object and for deleting an array. Uh, deleting an array, it actually looks up how many elements were in that chunk of memory, and it goes through and it deletes every element of that. It calls the destructor on every element in that in that array, and so it's actually a different function to do delete and delete square bracket. Uh, but what? Okay, we good now? Code good. <laughs> No. Use after free. So I'm using the heap. Remember the heap is allocated using new. I'm using the heap after free. It should come after the for loop. The delete, the delete should come after the for loop. Now, if I turn off address sanitizer, by the way, if I turn off address sanitizer, 
to you. Everything's fine. Look, it works. So, you know, Shook said you can't print the array because you deleted it, right? No, I could print it. It's, it, it's, it's going to be all zeros most of the time. Probably. Maybe. <laughs> usually, I would say. I'd say usually. Because we delete it and then we immediately print the, the, the arrays there. It's probably, yeah, it's probably always going to be zeros. No guarantee. No guarantee that those were all these zeros, but yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, but address sanitizer was absolutely, and, th and this is why memory errors are so pernicious because they will silently work and th your code's wrong. And then you put in more and more code and then somebody ends up using that memory and uh, you start getting numbers where it should be zeros. You're like, ah, what's going on? And that's why address sanitizer is a blessing, okay? You should always compile your code with address sanitizer and it will tell you when you goofed up, right? You're using the heap after you freed it and it tells you exactly which line of code you did it on and, and all that kind of stuff, okay? So, let's see if that matters. Main. Let's see if it tells us what line it's on. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, if you the the dash G means include debugging information, so I, I didn't do that before, and so you can see up here it just tells me the offset that it crashed at, like the memory offset, which is utterly unhelpful. If you turn on debugging with this, then um, it tells you the line number. So it crashed on main.cc line nine, and then you can open up main.cc line nine. You guys know you can do that. That opens up them on line nine. Hey, so there you go. So that will take you to line nine, and that you know, oh yeah, okay. I'm using it after freeing. Okay, so let's fix this. Do this now. Let's do this. Int array two equals array, and I'm gonna set array two um, element seven equal to four twenty. So I am. I'm just changing array two, right? Array array one shouldn't change, right? Let's just call it array one to keep things straight. The OG array. Array one should all be zeros still, right? I didn't ever change array one, right? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, if you type colon nine, that'll take you to line nine. Um, I usually go like three shift G, nine shift G to jump around. Lowercase GG takes you to the top, shift G takes you to the bottom. Very useful. I didn't change array one's pointer. Yeah, the pointer is not changed. But remember what this is doing is that this is saying access the memory seven integers to the right of array two and set that value to be 420. So if we print out array one, look, even though I never changed array one, you know, in code anywhere, I'm only changing array two, array one got changed also. And the reason for that is because both of these pointers are pointing at the same chunk of memory. So when you call new, it just returns an int. It's a memory address. It's a pointer. It's a memory. It's just an int. It's just the address in RAM where there's a block of 4K of, of RAM. And when you do this, this one now holds the same memory address as that one. And so when you say go seven integers to the right of that memory address, that's what square brackets mean. They mean just start it, this uh, this memory address, and go seven integers to the right, go 28 bytes to the right. Every, every int is four bytes, so seven bits to the right is 28 bytes to the right. At that address, write the number 420. Then when we print the array out, uh, we print from the same memory address the first 20, first 20 elements in that array, and hey, there's 420 there. Where did that come from? It's not a double free either, because we're not deleting it twice. If I did this, uh, it would be a double free. Crash. Tempting a double free. 
Okay. Without it, technically this code is conformant. This this code, according to the C++ standard, is actually correct. There's nothing technically wrong with this. Because sometimes you do want to use a pointer at something to change that, that something. There's nothing actually wrong with this code. Except you, you might be baffled because you think you might think that this is copying one array to another. You know what I mean? It doesn't. It's just copying the memory address of the array. So let me draw this out using the power of Microsoft OneNote. So how's that C side forty one? Oh yeah, that is C side forty one. Yeah, like a circle or something. Um doo -doo 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 -doo, new page, uh arrays and pointers and stuff. All right, so what happens when you um, when you call new is that it just allocates a big chunk of RAM that's 4K in size because I'm making a thousand a thousand ints times four bytes per int. It's four thousand. Okay. And when new returns, it, it allocates this chunk of memory. This is somewhere within RAM. Like RAM is like you know it's a big big thing. And it's going to return a memory address. Like let's say it returns the memory address one thousand. Okay. And so R is uh, R is pointing at memory address one thousand. Okay. And so R is literally equal to the number one thousand. When you have an array, it's literally just an integer. Okay. It's it's the type of it. The type of it is int star which means at pointer, it holds the memory address of an integer. But it's it's really just itself, just an address in memory. And so when you say array two equals array one, then array two is now just equal to the number 1000. And so the way we draw it is array two is also pointing to that memory address. And if you were to say array two square bracket zero, well, that's this memory address also. <laughs> that means when you use square brackets, that means go zero integers to the right. Okay, well, that's the same address then, isn't it? Okay. Uh, you could use arrow as a pointer also, sure. But uh, that's for class, uh, yeah. So you'd say, if, if, it had a, if it had a member variable, you, you could use like that, but these are just ints. So if you wanted to print out the value there, like if you wanted to print out, because this thing, when we made it, it's all zeros, right? The actual values there are just zeros, right? This is that memory address 1,000. Okay. But the, the array itself is just like 1,000 zeros. So if I wanted to print out the value at array 2 or r or at r2 square bracket 0 or at r1 square bracket 0, which are all pointing at the exact same uh, thing, you know, really, um, the address of these are all the, these are all the same number. I could do this. I could see out star r like that. So if I wanted to print out the value at Understand? So the star operator um, gives you the value at that's been that's being pointed to by by a pointer. Now, um, so R two square bracket seven, R one square bracket seven, they're both the same, the exact same place in RAM that's being read to and written to. Now, why does this matter for classes? Well, when you're doing a class, and uh,
really. So now we've got a vector class like this. So we can say vector vec makes 100 ints. And we can say vec square bracket 42 equals 420. And we can say see out vec square bracket 42. Vector is not declared, I call it. So there you go. So, um, so every time you make a vector, it allocates 100 ints. Every time the thing goes out of scope, it deletes the 100 ints. Now, this is violating, though, the rule of three. The rule of three says, says if you allocate a resource, like with new, you will need destructor, an operator equals overloaded for it, and a copy constructor. Which is going to be a vector, um, uh, a constructor that takes another con another vector as constructor. Okay. If you don't, your code's going to be buggy. And so let me show you how it's going to be buggy. So if I say you got vector vec, and I do all that stuff, and then I make a vector vector uh, vec2 and say vec2 vec equals vec and I see out vec2 42 this is going to be the same as that guy and this is a problem when you when you copy one vector to another you're not expecting their internal pointers to be pointing at the same thing what's happening here uh, no, let's turn off address sanitizer because it is not going to be happy about us then that um, is you see that so vector vector one's element forty two is set to four twenty vector two's element forty two is set to four twenty also what happened was we had a situation just like this where vector one's array is pointing to one spot and vector two's array is pointing to the same spot and that's because the default operator equals sets the array of vector two to be equal to vector so what it's doing here is behind the scenes this is the implicit operator equals does a vec two dot array equals vec dot array. You guys see that? And so what's happening is like what we had before a second ago was we're, we now have two arrays that are pointing at the same spot. And so when you read and write to one of them, you're reading and writing to the other one. And that is really bad. And what makes it even worse is that when they go out of scope, it calls the destructor and frees one of the vectors. And then when the other goes out of scope, it tries double freeing that same block of memory and it doesn't work. So we need to we need to fix this. Last time I, I showed you how to delete the equals operator. Today I'm going to show you how to do it uh, more properly because you would expect basically for one vector to copy all of its elements over to the new one. So we are going to make, uh, first of all, a copy constructor. So we're going to make a vector that takes another vector uh, by reference uh, named other. And um, so this is something called a copy constructor uh, called with call by value function. Calls. So if you ever take a function by value, like a function uh, 
because this is called by a value, it will call the copy constructor. So the copy constructor tells you how do you make a copy of a vector, okay? And it's also called uh, down here. If we did this, sec, this will call the copy constructor. This calls operator equals. So the operator equals and the copy constructor are usually going to be pretty, pretty similar. Except the equals operator can be called at any time. The copy constructor only gets called when the thing is made. So uh, to, to start off, we're going to be doing something very similar. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to still allocate 100 bytes of memory. And then we're going to do this. For int, for int i equals 0, i is less than 100, i plus plus. Magic numbers are bugging me. We're going to say our array element i is equal to their array element i. So this is something called a deep copy. What we were doing before was doing a shallow copy. So what was happening was we weren't duplicating the vector. We had a vector with 100 elements in it. We're making a new one out of that one. Before, what was happening was the two pointers are just pointing out the same chunk of memory. It's called a shallow copy. When you read to one, you read. You, you, when you write to one, you're, you're writing to, to the other as well. Uh, this is something called a deep copy. So we actually allocate a separate 100 bytes of, in, of integers here. And then we have to do a for loop and go through all of the elements of the other array and copy all of their elements into ours. And then everything is fine. Everything is hunky dory. We have to do the same thing though for the um, for the operator equals. So the equals operator, um, the thing might already exist, right? Like we might already have 100 people of our own. And so when we do this, you have to delete the memory you currently have allocated, then allocate new memory and copy the copy the memory over. Okay. And, uh, yeah. and there you go. So this is the rule of three. Um, rule of three, copy constructor. Three assignment operator. There's something called the rule of five now, by the way. Don't worry about it for now. It's not. It's not as crucial as this. Um, do you guys have any questions about this? Because we are allocating in our constructor, we need the rule of three. This is not part of the rule three. The operator square bracket here just lets us use it. So it is both a getter and a setter, essentially. You see here, we can we can write to it using the square bracket operator, and we can read from it using the square bracket operator. And that's because it's actually returning a pointer to that person in the index. It's returning a reference. Okay, So it, it returns a pointer that doesn't behave like a pointer. It behaves like a regular integer. And so when you do this, this, you know, that's like a regular integer, right? Except it's actually the integer inside of the vector. It's not a returned copy of it. It's the actual vector 42 when you do it this way. This is how like vector.at works. When you do vector.at, it um, returns a reference to that element in the vector. Yeah, yeah this is basically dot .at. With, yeah. We can do that. 
and add bounce checking mode. Event index is greater than equal to size, throw, run, timer. No, you are out of bounds. And so then we could do that and say vector dot. 42. And this would work exactly the same way as this, except it's bounds checking now. So if we try going out of bounds, no, you are out of bounds. Okay, see that? So you can use the this calls operator square bracket, right? Because square brackets are operators. It's, it's literally a function called operator square bracket. And it takes a parameter. What's a parameter? The index. There you go. Uh, and if you want to do bounds checking, you can call .at, and then we can bounds check it. And this will uh, copy from one vector to another. This will call the equals operator, operator single equals, and it will throw away vector two's existing array, allocate a new array, and then do a deep copy of all of vector one's stuff into vector two stuff. And And you'll see that vector one has 420 in that spot, and vector two has 420 in that spot, but there's no double free. Because they both have a copy. At the moment, at the moment they're copied, they're the same. If we wanted to, though, we could change it at that point. Vector two, two let's increment it by one. And you'll see they no longer you'll see they no longer go hand in hand with each other. Okay, so I'm gonna increment, I'm gonna copy it, I'm gonna copy the whole vector, and then I'm incrementing vector two's version by one point. And you can see that the vector one has the original value of 420, vector two, we copy it. And it gets the value 420, then we increment it by 1, and we have 420, 1 now, right there. Yeah, so, so when you return a reference, um, when you return a reference, you're, re you're actually returning a pointer to that particular integer. It's just references or pointers that behave like regular variables. So we're, so we're, returning, a, we're returning a pointer but it doesn't behave like a pointer. It behaves just like a regular variable. So when we set it equal to 420, it's actually gonna to go to that pointer's location in RAM and, and actually write into vector square bracket 42, the value of 420. This isn't a copy. If, if we just returned an int, it would be a copy. This would change a copy and it would accomplish nothing because this function here would return a, um, a copy and then you try changing it. In fact, I don't even know if it would compile, I think. Yeah, it won't even compile. The reason for that is because um, that copy that you made, it's a temporary variable. You can't write to it. It's got no memory address. So you can't even you can't even write to it if you return a normal integer, right? It's like it's it's trying to say like 7 is equal to 50. Like you can't set 7 to be 50. Like it like it doesn't even it doesn't even make sense. Right. So this is this is how you can make your your code look and and and, and at the end of the day, it's all very nice and and, and readable, right? Like you, you make a vector and that and our vectors here are just hundred ints, whatever. And then you can just read and write to um, you know any of those hundred elements using square brackets and or, or dot at if if you want, you know. Dot at if you want bounds checking, square brackets if you don't. And then you can copy from one vector to another. Um, if you do it at the moment of creation, it calls the copy constructor. If you do it after the moment of creation if you do it after the moment of creation, then um, Leave that in there so you can look at it. This will call the default constructor. So the default constructor is going to allocate 100 integers. And then when we do the assignment operator, the equals operator, uh, it throws away the 100, it, it deletes them properly, it throws away the 100 uh, integers the vector 2 has, and then it allocates 100 more and copies the values over from vec. It does a deep copy. And then we have a copy of 420 in our slot 42. 
We increment its value by one, becomes 421, and this code here prints 420, and this code here prints 421. Okay. Why can't you just override the existing R when you call the equals operator? If we did this, if uh, that's that's that problem that I showed you earlier. If, if all we do is say r is equal to other dot r, now both r's are pointing at the same spot in memory. So if you change vector 1's slot 7, vector 2's slot 7 will change also because they're both sharing the same chunk of memory. It's shared memory between the two of them. Now sometimes you might want to share memory between two things, but in general you want array to be pointing at you know, 100 ints, and you want array 2 to be pointing at 100 different ints. You don't want them pointing at the same ones, because when you read and write to one, you're reading and writing to the other one. And then, worse, when they go out of scope, it's going to do a double free, because um, we are going to delete their array. And then when they go out of scope, they delete their array, and that's a double free. That's a segfault. That's a paddle-in. Okay? So, um, I'm lost on delete score bracket. Uh, there are two ways of deleting things in C++. One with delete, one with delete square bracket. And uh, regular variables get deleted with delete. Arrays get deleted with delete square bracket. Specifically C style arrays. It's literally a different function that it's called. And the reason why it does that is because um, delete invokes a single destructor on the person that's being called, and delete square bracket has a for loop in it that runs over every element of the array and goes delete, 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 delete. So if you have a, a destructor on your class, like a person class, and you've got an array of persons, when it goes out of scope, it has to call the destructor on all thousand elements in the array. And that's that's the difference. And and you might you might be justified in saying like uh, it should just know and figure it out. And you're probably right. Uh, it's it's probably a speed thing, where you don't have to check if it's a if, if it's an array or not. So when you just call delete, it doesn't have to check am I an array or not. It doesn't have to have a for loop. It's probably faster. So that's probably why there's two different ones. It's, it's just purely a purely a um, speed thing. Also because C arrays suck <laughs> and you don't know when you have a pointer if it's an array like because it could just be pointing at a single integer right <laughs> when you have a pointer a pointer uh, an integer pointer like this it, it, it could actually just be pointing at a single integer and there's no way in the type system to know is this pointing at one int or is it pointing at a thousand ints? it doesn't know it's a massive problem with c style arrays which is another reason why you should never use them. Okay. If you delete it, how can you access vector one? Uh, the the destructor, the destructor, uh, the destructor gets called when it goes out of scope. The destructors are getting called here. Oh, you mean I I get I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. So you're talking about right here, right? Yeah. This frees up the 100 ints we made before. We make 100 new ints now. Important off, does that make sense? So we had before 100 integers allocated, and then we're freeing up that memory, and then we're going to allocate 100 new ones. Technically, um, we could get away with just not doing that if you want. That works fine too. Okay. Uh, the reason why I was doing that is because uh, you know in, in reality vectors have different sizes, right? So if you had if you had a vector of seven and a vector of three, you you know what I mean? Like you would delete and you re you delete the old one reallocate based on the new size, and then copy all the elements over. Um, this one, because it's a stupid class example, 
Um, always has a size of 100, it, it doesn't matter. But um, yeah. uh, if you're going to have vectors of different sizes, then you would unallocate the current one and allocate a new one, copy over. Yeah, good question. Good question. That's a, that's a good catch. So, yeah, so the destructors get called here, and then they free up the memory. So that's the rule of three. The rule of three says um, if you do allocations in a constructor, you're going to need a copy constructor. Copy constructors get called in two places. One, when you do this, when you initialize one vector with another vector, that calls the copy constructor. It copies from one of the vectors into the other. Two, when you do call by value. Remember, call by value could be considered call by copy. It, it creates a copy of the of the vector that you pass in, and that's why we don't use call by value <laughs> because it's gonna it, like look at this. It's, every time you call a function with the call by value function with a vector, it's gonna have to sit there and copy a hundred integers over, right? It's stupid. <laughs> we only, we only do that like if if like we literally want to have a copy, like you know, and and, and so the way that I, I the Java does it, I actually like like you. You'd have to say like vector dot clone. Like if you wanted to call foo, call by value, you would actually do this. So if in in Java, this is the Java way, not C plus plus way. Java, you have to really ask for a copy, right? So you, when you call the function, you'd call foo, and then you'd say clone that, clone that. So duplicate the whole thing, and then pass that in by reference. Uh, it, it makes it a lot. It, honestly, it's a good. It's a good design decision. It actually makes it very clear. I really do want to make a copy of these million integers. Whereas a lot of um, C++ programmers just consider call by value the default, and then they just pass in a vector with a billion elements in it to print the third one, and they and the thing starts off and it duplicates the entire vector. You know, does a billion copies, prints the third one out. Then it has to call the deleter, then it frees the memory and it has to delete, calls the destructor on a billion elements in it. Yeah. So call by call by uh, call by value is bad with unless you want it, unless you want to copy. Like like it's not it's not hundred percent bad. Like sometimes you do want to copy, but at least in Java, like you have to be very explicit with it, like yes, I want a copy of it. And in this one it just sort of happens invisibly. And it calls the copy constructor. And so one of one of the things I actually do a lot is to disable the copy constructor. Um, I'll I'll actually do this. I'll, I'll actually do this a lot. Um, if, if if my thing should never be duplicated, then by deleting the copy constructor, that prevents me that prevents me from calling uh, by calling by value ever. <laughs> Did you guys see the syntax on that? This deletes the implicit copy constructor, and if you do that, then your your type cannot be passed by value. And sometimes it's actually um, sometimes it's what you want. I don't want ever you to make a copy for me. If I need to make a copy, I'll make it myself. <laughs> you know, and so I will actually delete the copy constructor quite often when working with my own projects because I just never want to accidentally copy uh, a thing because it can cause you know it's inefficient and then if you have pointers and stuff like that it can cause these pointer issues and stuff like that so I just leave it and then I'll just make like a I'll make it like a clone function right I'll just make a function called uh, clone you know and and just do it explicitly so but and that fulfills that fulfills the rule of three, by the way, because you have a copy constructor. Because uh, you 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 have a copy constructor, you just you know deleted it, <laughs> right? So oftentimes I'll delete the assignment operator and I'll delete the copy constructor just so that I cannot duplicate an object by accident ever. Okay, so. Um, that is our lecture for today. We went over two things. We went over how to sort um, sort your classes based on different uh, fields, sort by name, sort by last name, age, social, and then we went 
more depth on the rule of three. We talked a little bit about it last time, but today, today's your rule of three lecture. And um, the rule of five, uh, you don't have to worry about as much. It's just an optimization thing. When you move, uh, we haven't even talked about moving yet. Um, it, it's just m more of an optimization thing. It's not, it's not, it's not crucial. If you don't do the rule of three, you, it will explode your code. It will explode your code base. Um, if you don't do the rule of five, it just runs slower. And I, however, use the rule of zero. No allocations. I just don't use new very often these days. I let vectors and things like that ma manage my memory for me. I don't worry about it. And then I, all the implicit, the 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 uh, implicit equals operator, copy constructor, all of them just work naturally, beautifully. Um, peace of mind. It's nice. No news is good news. Always go for the rule of zero when possible. That's yeah. I think that's I think that's probably. You, you can't always, you know, you can't always. Like sometimes you're going to be, like if you're making your own vector class, like you're not going to get away from allocations because a vector class, their whole job is to manage memory for other people. Like somebody has got to do it. Like at, at some point you can't just pass the buck forever. You know, like somebody else handled the managed memory. Like at, at some point somebody has to do it. And that somebody is like the author of the vector class or whatever. Um, but yeah, usually, usually I just use the rule of zero and I just use, the standard template libraries containers to do my memory management for me. I'll use unordered maps and vectors, and that's 95% of my use cases. Maps, sets, vectors, unordered maps, unordered sets, unordered multi-maps, multi-sets, like there's variants on, on those things. But basically, yeah, vectors and maps are my bread and butter, and I rarely do anything different these days. Rule of zero, it's really nice. You only use the rule of three when you use new. Yes, if you use new, you must use the rule of three. And your new must go into your constructor. Don't do it out, don't do it outside. Like don't have like main, like don't, like this would be really horrible. Like if you said like vector.r equals new. And this would be, this would be garbage. This would be so bad. Let me make it public. It's another reason why we don't uh, we don't have public member variables, right? Do you do you understand what the problem is with this? What's wrong with this? Can you explain it? Yeah. Well, so if you, the, the constructor is the place to do a new, I'm showing you what's wrong if you don't do your news in your constructor. Main is doing the new for it. It's it's newing memory and it's passing in. Um, for, for one thing, it's leaking memory. Let's start with that. So this allocated 100 ints. And then when we did this, R is now pointing at 20 ints and those previous 100 ints are lost. That's leaked memory. That memory, right? It, this just leaked 100, 100 ints of memory. Okay. Is this going to bounds check properly? I'm trying to access element 30 out of 20. Does dot at know how big its block of memory is anymore? No, it doesn't. As far as it knows, it still has 100 integers to to mess around with and you just went and 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 leaked 100 bytes of memory for it and gave it 20 new integers 100 not 100 bytes 100 ints of memory 400 bytes of memory uh and you just gave it 20 new ones and now it, it still thinks it has 100 and so this is going to very happily uh go out of bounds and and what makes it even worse is that it'll even work if we did this let's comment out all this code down here uh, this this code will actually work. That's that's what makes this memory management stuff so so very annoying. Look, it worked. Right? 
I set element 10 to be 400, I see it out, I got 400. Uh, if I turn on address sanitizer, the only problem I'm going to get is I'm going to get uh, a memory leak warning, right? Because uh, I allocated 100 bytes here and I never deleted it. So, you know, maybe we even do this vector dot, uh, let's see, delete. It hurts my brain just to do it. Vector dot array. It actually doesn't matter where the space is, it's all good. Um, I, usually, I usually do it like this. Oops. Um, now the code's correct. Now you have an address sanitizer who's complaining about it. It must be perfect. But our class has, has lost its invariant, right? What invariant has been violated? Couldn't you set the size as cons to prevent that? If, if I'm not if I'm not having my pointer be private I've lost control of that invariant this this class the class invariant is invariant number one because oftentimes you have more than one is size is 100 right this is always a hundred integers always and if I don't make that that member variable private then somebody some joker in, in mains like oh you know what I need a little bit more memory you know, this, this thing is not quite big enough for me, you know? And, uh, and there you go. Like now I can, now I can read and write to 110, right? Except now, uh, it's throwing an exception because dot at still thinks dot at still thinks we have size hundred. So when you give up your, your private member variables, you, you've lost control of the invariant. Okay. That's why it's so crucial that all the news and all of the deletes go into the constructor and into the destructor. That is the right place for them, okay? Never allow a new or delete anywhere else, basically, um, in, in situations like this, at least. Um, yeah. Or if you do, be, be very careful with it. Oh. So... Um, So let's go ahead and put this back in here. Now, the question was, is it only when doing news, right? No. Uh, sometimes you allocate other resources as well. The, the only one that we care about for this class is new, allocating memory. Um, can multiple overloaded operators be used in the same statement? Sure. Yeah. Like, remember, just an operator is just a function call, right? Like, anytime you use equals, it's just going to look for a function named operator equals you know, that takes that type as a parameter. Um, so you only use a rule of three when you use new. No, there's other things you can allocate besides just memory. Like what if, uh, what if uh, you want exclusive access to the sound card on your computer, right? That was, that was how Windows used to do it. You could only have one application playing sound on Windows at a time. Do you guys know that? That was up. That was up to like XP, like Windows XP. You could only have a single uh, application playing audio at a time. Every time you you wanted to play sound on audio, you had to take exclusive control of the audio system. And then when you were done with it, you would have to hand it back to the operating system and be like, "All right, somebody else can use it now. Somebody else can play with play with play audio, play with my toy." And so that Hesterberg would be an example of something that would go into the constructor. And then when you're done, the destructor would release the audio card so that other people could use it. So when you start playing a sound, you seize control of the audio. When you're done, you release control of it. If you, if you manually seize control, not in a constructor and destructor, then maybe it never gets released and, and Windows is blocked from playing any sound. You have to reboot your computer or start control deleting like applications that might have control of it or not. So there, there are other things in addition to just memory. Like you can allocate, um, in addition to RAM, you could allocate network uh, connections. And so when you open a network connection, you need to make sure you close it. If you don't close the network connection and you quit your program, that socket is open for five minutes. 
and you try launching your program again and try opening up the same socket like you're making some quiz show thing it won't work for five minutes you've just locked yourself out you just played yourself right um a database connections would get allocated in a constructor and deallocated in a destructor um, all of those sorts of things you would use the rule of three for unless you really want them to share the same network socket or you know what i mean like um like you can't share the like if you have exclusive audio and you duplicate it who who gets ex like it you know what i mean like you have to use the rule of three to to handle that like anytime you have an you have an, or an allocation not just memory for other things as well uh thanks for coming to my ted talk <laughs> for this class just worry about memory how about that okay. All right. so yeah things uh, it, it's a it's a philosophy called ray so um ray stands for allocate your stuff in constructors and deallocate in destructors. It stands for resource acquisition as initialization, which means nothing. Like it's actually just a dumb acronym, but everybody knows it. We just call it Ray. Resource acquisition as initialization. Um, so basically, when you have a constructor, that's where your allocations go. Network sockets, database connections, memory allocations, whatever. And the destructor cleans up after you. And the C++ language will pretty much guarantee your destructor will get called. Uh, the only time it won't is like um, somebody turns off power on your machine or, you know, something like that. Um, somebody calls the syscall exit. You get a sig kill signal sent to you. There's there's ways of making it so your destructor doesn't get called when the program like catastrophically dies. Uh, stack overflow. Um, you, can't, you can't call a destructor if there's a stack overflow because the destructor requires stack space and you have no stack space left. Uh, but basically, in C++, it will do its damnedest to guarantee that anything you allocate in a constructor will get, your destructor will get called when your thing goes away. Okay, so I see people are uh, logging off, and that's fine. I, I did go over today, but it, it, this is a very important topic. So I will hang out for a little bit. If you have any questions about fractions, uh, just pepper me with it. But that's our, that's our talk for today. It's a, it's a very important concept as you go forward into data structures. So um, the Zybooks is on this kind of thing too. So hopefully between me and the Zybooks, it'll it'll click for you and make sense. All right. Anyone read Main and Savage? Yeah, I was actually a beta tester for Savage's uh, textbook. Got two of his two of his textbooks back there. Um, it was nice. It was it was nice being a beta tester because we didn't have to pay for it. So um, he, you know. We, we just went to the zebra copy down by UCSD and pick up a Z, Xerox copy of, of the textbook, you know, and halfway through the semester as, as he's writing it, we get like the second half of it, you know, it's like 10 bucks or whatever, instead of the $300 or whatever they charge, 150. So, um, yeah. Oh, okay. I gotta go. All right. See you guys.